Good afternoon. My name is Roberta Studerman. I'm with the Alzheimer's Association, and I'm thrilled to be here with you today to introduce the next session. The Alzheimer's Association is the leading fundraising organization for Alzheimer's and dementia-related diseases. We are also focused on advocacy and programming to make certain that our families and our communities are represented as we fight this disease. Today, we are here to hear from Anna Fall and Joe Dia. D'Ambrioso, right? I said that right, right? You're not even listening to me. Good. Thank yes. you. Uh, <laughs> we are here to talk about healthcare for seniors. Healthcare for seniors is as much about clinical factors as it is about social, environmental, and economic factors. Optimal aging, making every day the best it can be, is a challenge for many seniors. But in rural communities, it's even more difficult. At the Traeger, UofL Traeger Institute, they have developed the Flourish Model of Care, which is a team-based, coordinated care approach that, <clears throat> excuse me, that interrelates products of health care, personal health choices, and individual social determinants as part of their health care. To share more about this and the outcomes they've experienced, please help us welcome Joe and Anna to the stage. Thank you. Want to pull it out? Hello. <laughs> Thank you all for having us here today. We're excited. The Traeger Institute is a healthcare research and healthcare training institute that also provides primary care and specialized geriatric medicine care. We also have a mosaic of services that we're trying to wrap around patients, and we have a small goal, and that is to change the way healthcare is offered in our city. That's our goal. Dr. Fall is leading us, and together, we are the disruptors. Yes, we are. We're going to disrupt you today. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we've asked Dr. Fall to tell a personal story to start us off to tell you how we're failing to flourish right now in our city. So you know what? Um, when we started to plan this thing, uh, we decided to do a TED Talk, and we don't know how to do a TED Talk. But we do know that in order to tell a story and to tell people to become excited about something different, you need to make it personal. So my story today is to share with you a very personal story of how I experience a broken system. And they say you can only really understand a broken system until you experience it. So here is my very short story. On June 6, my husband woke up with a numb chin. And that was the beginning of a very, very long journey that is still ongoing. And that journey uh, started with he's going to his primary care physician to find out why is his chin numb. The physician referred him immediately to a, another doctor for an opinion. That referral went nowhere. Two weeks later, we still were not in to see someone. By that time, we have read the internet and found that this is, could be something really, really serious and we need to see a doctor. So, of course, I can't sit still. I'm this A personality person who needs to get to see someone. So I reach out to people I know, they reach out to people they know, and we finally got an appointment. But think about it, I had to reach out to people I know who know other people. So we finally got an appointment with a person, and it went on and on and on. Another appointment with another one, another appointment with another one. And in the end, there were almost six different doctors that we saw in a very short time. And you will not believe it, there was four medical health records associated with these six appointments. And none of these electronic health records talked to one another. And very few of the doctors talked to one another. So now we're like one and a half months in, my husband's chin is still numb, and we don't know what is going on. And we need to go on vacation to celebrate his 60th birthday, and we don't know if we can even go, but there's no answer for us. So this continue, this story continue and continue for two and a half months. And two and a half months later, after one of these doctors, one of these six doctors decided to become our health navigator. 
He decided to call everyone. He decided to send the data to a unique place to analyze it for us. And he was, an, he was finally diagnosed with stage four lymphoma. And he's in very aggressive treatment as we speak. No one, even in all this time, even after the diagnosis even, told us what you expect from the treatment. So now we get at the next stage. First you get to the access piece, how to get access to the care you need and the diagnosis you need. Now, how do you get the care you need? So we went through the first phase of chemo. That was awful. No one told, told us about the pain he's going to have because it has metastasized in his bones. No one told us about constipation and how to manage it when you're on very 96 hours of chemo at one time. No one tells you this. You have to find it out for yourself. No one tells you about diet. No one tells you about alternative strategies to handle pain. You have to figure all this out by yourself in a lonely world of dealing with cancer. And that's four months after his sister died of cancer. So, what I want to talk to you all about today is how can we make my husband flourish again? He's not flourishing. He wasn't. For two and a half months, it was hell. And it's still sort of there. But we are making a lot of strides because we've learned some skills along the way. So that's the beginning of our story about the broken system. Thank you for sharing that. So our talk today, we're going to really go over what it means to flourish. What does it look like? How are, are we flourishing today, especially in Kentucky? What can we do to flourish, actually, differently? And what does the future look like for us? So, the first place we always go is Webster's Dictionary. So flourish. Think about what does it mean to you all? What does it mean to flourish? This is the dictionary's version of it to grow luxuriantly, to achieve success, to reach heights of development or influence, or to make bold and sweeping gestures. Is that flourishing in your minds? Yes, no? Go to the next. So, this is an important point. To flourish is not to be free of disease. To flourish is not to be free from disabilities because we all will struggle with diseases at some point in our time, like we've all learned. We all have stories like I had just told you. It's also not high cognitive functioning. You can flourish despite the fact that you may not have all your cognitive functioning in place. It is not necessarily active engagement with life. It's not necessarily high physical functioning. Those, those are things that's great, but you don't need all of that to get to a level of flourishing. Everyone should be able to flourish. Even the person in the latest stage of Alzheimer's should be flourishing until they take the last breath. This is what we're trying to change at the Traeger Institute. People have associated flourishing with being well and being happy. We'll go into this a little more in a minute. But really, flourishing is about living that best life that we can live in the moment that we're in, no matter what our conditions are. And I want to focus on that last little sentence there. It's to be proactively and reactively responding and interacting with any context that comes our way. So that means I have been given the opportunity to learn how to handle a cancer diagnosis and very aggressive treatment. I need to be proactively aware as to what I need to do and I need to respond reactively to what's coming our way in the best way possible. That's all I have, that's all I can do. So how do I do it within a broken system? And that is what we're trying to figure out here. But really it's about that optimal life functioning despite whatever you have. And, help, and, and to have a system around people so that they can get to that optimal functioning. So most think that flourishing is being happy. If you go back to Aristotle, Aristotle said that flourishing was really eudaimonia. It was being happy. 
But we've learned that over the years, and especially through the uh, research that has been done, that flourishing means a lot more. Martin Seligman is our big researcher on Flourish. He's written a number of books. One good book that you all should read is called Flourish. And he actually goes through the whole research on flourishing. And the way he looks at it is flourishing includes positive emotions, engagement, deep relationships, having meaning, and having some achievement. So I'm going to tell you two quick stories of flourishing. I'm going to tell you how I flourish. On Friday morning, I wake up every Friday morning, and I go to my refrigerator, and I take out my sourdough starter, because I've learned how to make sourdough. I took a course. I take my starter out. I put it out on the counter. Then I go to work. And when I come home, my sourdough has risen. And I look at it, I feed it, I empty it out, I feed it for the next day because my big day is going to be Saturday. Put it away that night, 74 degrees. Saturday morning I wake up, my sourdough is risen, it's very active. So now I have to make my bread. I take my sourdough starter, I mix it with flour, I mix it with water and a little salt, and then I take, my wife calls it my baby. I take my babies and I take them and I massage them and I mix them for 10 minutes. Then I have to wait 10 more minutes. Then I do it again. I have to turn them 30 times, 30 times. I have two bowls, 30 times. Then I wait 10 more minutes. I do this four more times. Then after that, I have to do it one more time. Then I have to wait another half hour, then another half hour. So now it's about 11 o'clock and I'm finally finished with my sourdough bread. Well, can I bake it? Anybody sourdough bakers in here? No, you can't bake it. You have to put it back in the refrigerator and let it proof overnight. So Sunday morning, I finish my visit to my temples, Trader Joe's and Whole Foods. I come home. <laughs> I come home, and then I turn my oven up to 475. gets nice and hot. You just can't put the bread in. You have to put it in a Dutch oven, which is even more problematic. Put my, du my Dutch oven in. It heats up. I then wait. It heats up. I take it out. I put my bread in. 20 minutes. I have to take the top off. Goes back in for 14 minutes. And I'm waiting. The smells through the house. It comes out. Can I eat it? No, you cannot eat it. You have to wait another hour. <laughs> so another hour goes by. I always cheat a little bit. I take my vegan butter, I cut a slice, take my vegan butter, I put it on, and I enjoy my sourdough bread. My wife thinks I'm crazy because I do all this from Friday until Sunday, but that is making me flourish. I have positive emotions while I'm doing that. I feel engaged. I have a relationship with my bread. The starter and I are friends. So that's, for me, that's flourishing. But let me tell you one other quick story. This was happening while we were doing a survey, a needs assessment. Uh, we were doing a survey, and I was sitting at a table, and I see a man coming in on a wheelchair, motorized wheelchair. He had oxygen on him. Comes in, he comes up to me, he said, uh, I want to take uh, your survey. And I'm thinking to myself, the first question was the self-rated health question. How do you rate your health poor to excellent? And I was thinking, oh, fine, okay, you know, come on over. And I, I asked him the first question, how do you rate your health? He went, uh, excellent. <laughs> and the student that I was with looked at me with her eyes like this, because we had another 50 questions that we had to ask. And I said, well, let's stop a little bit. Please explain to me why are you reporting that you're excellent? He said, uh, last week, I was really bad. This week, I saw my friends, I played cards, I was able to eat, and here we thought he was going to die in front of us at that moment in time, but for him, he was flourishing. So it doesn't matter. For me, I flourish in a certain way. For him, he was flourishing in a certain way. So that's the way we like to look at flourishing for our patients. It doesn't matter what disease you have or where you are in life, whether you have anxiety, disability, you could be flourishing and you should be flourishing at any point in your life. We all should be flourishing. And now you know when he's impossible at work, we send him to the kitchen <laughs> <laughs> so that he can flourish. <laughs> so really, this 
are the six areas that we try to focus on when it comes to wellness, when it comes to flourishing, is we want people to be physically well. Not well in the sense that you don't have any disease, but you do the best you can with your physical body. You exercise, you eat right. You do those things that can keep you well as long as possible. And we work people to empower them to know how to do that. We try to focus on social wellness. We try to focus on how to stay in your social environment. Uh, emotional wellness, purposeful wellness, spiritual wellness, intellectual wellness. How do, we, how do we get all of these people, all of these things accomplished when we're dealing with something like my husband is dealing with right now? That's, that's difficult, but how do we do it? And there are ways in which we can accomplish it if we do it right. So when you look at that, you think about quality of life, our next slide. We think about quality of life. So I was caregiver for an aunt that had Alzheimer's. And in her last days, the last week of her life, she was in a nursing home. And the woman next to her kept the prices right on, blasting on the phone because she couldn't hear real well. She had an oxygen tank that would, remember that noise? It would go like that all the time. And she, there was no quality of life for her. We had to get her in hospice, luckily came in. And we were able to get her a private room where Anna brought in lavender. Remember you brought in the lavender smell? We had Frank Sinatra playing. We increased her quality of life. She went from a person within three days, a person who was crunched over in bed, literally her head was up in the bed, to a person who was at peace. And she ended up dying in peace. That quality of life that we gave to her, it was not brain surgery. It was easy to do. But it, the system didn't allow us to do it. And, and we need to find, we need to infiltrate the system that will allow us to do these things. Um, one of the things I do to up my husband's quality of life in the hospital is, I bring him his own food because we can't stand the hospital food. And that in itself is quality of life. We're using the smell of lavender, like I just reminded me on that. Uh, we have a diffuser in the room. Everyone, all the nurses walks in and say, oh, this place smells so nice. In the morning, I make him the coffee he likes, not the hospital coffee. All of those things are amazing to get a person to be healthy because they can deal with the stuff that come their way because they're happy and content. So are we flourishing here in Kentucky? Well, okay. Now, let's change gears. Are we flourishing in Kentucky? And we, I think all of us who live in Kentucky sort of know the answer to that just by looking at just the prevalence of diseases is sort of a scary thought. So, shall I take them through? The, yeah, okay, go. just yes. very quickly, um, let's take you through some stats. The 65 plus population, this is Kentucky compared to the rest of the nation. We are number 45 out of 50 states. So what does that tell us? We're not doing great on any of these diseases. We're higher than the average in diabetes, heart disease, blood pressure, obesity, disabilities, general health, dental health, depression. That's not good. You can also then look at health behaviors. You can start looking at how many people in Kentucky eat healthy fruit and vegetables? How many people exercise? Well, we again, we are lower than the national average. So we need to do something. We need to figure this out and do something about it. But let me give you one more little bit of stats. The mortality rate per 1,000 in the state of Kentucky for cancer is much higher than the national average. Same for heart disease, lung disease, stroke, drugs, and suicide. So, the picture is not good. And, and now you can see Dr. Fall flourishing because as the st sadistic statistics professor, which I like to call her, she always has to have data in a presentation. And that is her, your way of flourishing. Yes, these were my first two slides I made. <laughs> <laughs> the rest came later. <laughs> so, so where does this leave us? Frustrated? We really don't know what to do. If you just look at data, you think to yourself, where are we and how are we ever going to get out of this? But, remain calm. <laughs> Remember that. 
think about that. We always have to remain calm, especially going to something like this, like this Converge today, and we see all of the creative thinking that came out and all of the, the, the vendors that are out there, all of the great ideas that are out there. So we do have a chance to change the way healthcare is offered. So the next piece is going to talk a little bit about what we can do differently to flourish in looking at the healthcare system. And I just want to tell you very quickly that we very recently changed Joe's title to Director of Wellness at the Traeger Institute. And we did it with a specific reason. Because a lot of us, you know, we are academics and we are practitioners and we do things the way we've always been doing things. And we are academics and we do the research and we look at all the scientific articles and then Joe sits there and he says nothing. And he thinks. And then the next thing he says is a disruptive statement. And that disruptive statement is focused on wellness. And saying, but is this really the best for the patient? Someone said the other day in the clinic where we, that we just started, said that I wish I could have that window that I can just open and, and ask for the insurance card and close it again so that I can be done with it. But now you've built this open space so I can't be done with these people. <laughs> And then you think about Joe, who says, what's good for that patient? Is it good for that patient to experience the window open up and the window closes down? I don't think so. But having them in an inviting space, that is good for the patient. So Joe is our wellness person, and he keeps making us think through it. He also forces us into lunches that we don't want to take. He forces us into <laughs> eating our food. My, my um, most disruptive <laughs> statement of the day is, it's lunchtime. And then, we kept, and then we keep having our meetings going on, and he just walks out and goes and eat his lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to put that out there because I think it's an important, we are joking about it now, but it's important to have a disruptor in your midst. You must have this voice, otherwise you make no progress. You know, you, you, you're either in the system or you're out the system or you're sort of here close to the end of the system into a new system and that's sort of where we are. But we need someone like Joe to help us with that. So I appreciate that role that he takes. And that role was important for us to develop a method of how we can take care of patients in a different way. So we know that this is not flourishing, but some of the patients, right now with our new clinic, we've seen so far in, it's only two weeks. It feels like it's much longer. It feels like we've a only year. We've the clinic over two weeks. We've seen close to 500 patients four to 500 patients. So we're really seeing a lot of patients and we're seeing patients coming in with 20 medicines. That's healthcare. I was asking, I was asking a young, a young uh, resident the other day, I was watching him work with one of the older adults and I said, what does she eat for, for, you know, for her breakfast, lunch and dinner? He said, I don't know. He never asked the question, what was she eating? It's not on the agenda because they're trying to resolve a problem. She had COPD, and that was the problem. How are we going to fix the COPD? Didn't ask, does she have access to her house? Can she get in and out of her house? Can she do exercise? Does she have a sidewalk? We deal with a lot of people from rural Kentucky that don't have sidewalks. That, that, that has to be taught. Yeah, so we should move away from the idea of just giving them a pull, and that's it. Um, we also know that facility care is going down and home care is going up. So most, so if you think about rural health and you think, and I live in a rural community. I live in, I live in Henry County. It's about an hour away from, from here. And it's always been fine for me, the hour away from work. It's not so fine if you have to see a doctor five times a week and you have to drive in, you know, and drive back. And you don't have time to go and see an acupuncturist on top of that. You don't have time to go to an exercise class or anything like that. It's too much. So I learn, I'm privileged to learn what it is to live in a rural county and not having everything quickly available to me that I need for my husband in the moment. So it's interesting how it makes me then think, what do I need to do? What can I do to make it possible for him to get the things he need and to get the support he need in that environment? And that is the goal of what we are trying to accomplish here with a lot of our work in the rural areas, and we'll go into that in a minute. 
So we developed the Flourish model. Flourish Care is our brand that we're really promoting at the Institute, and it looks at six determinants of health. Right. Biological. So, yeah, so the first is one first. is biological. And I'm going to just talk about the first two first, and then I'm going to ask Joe to tell the story about what happened the other day in the clinic. Um, so the first one is biological. You can have a genetic predisposition for certain things. You can have a specific disease that's related, that's because of certain biological things in your body. We have to address that. No questions asked. We know that. But lots of the healthcare currently is focused only on that. Then you have psychological well-being. You have the psychological determinants of health. And those are the things, the trauma you experience in life, the depression you have, the stress, the wellness you feel, the happiness you feel, the satisfaction with life. All of those things are what we normally think is separated from the biological pieces. But, oh my, are they integrated. So, Joe, your story. Sure, yes, this just happened in our second week of operation in the clinic, and we are, you'll see some pictures. We have a real open format, but a patient came in and was having a seizure. The MDs went over, the nurses went over. I was just sitting, sort of observing, and the, the office really was like shaky. Everybody was really scared at that moment in time. They were going to call EMS. I went over and I asked the caregiver, is this a, uh, a non-psychological, a non-epileptic seizure or an epileptic seizure or just a seizure? And the caregiver said it's a non-epileptic seizure. So while they were getting ready to call EMS, I said, well, just hold on a minute. And I used a distraction technique for the patient. So I literally snapped my fingers in front of the patient. And I, I'm a clinical therapist, so I, I had some uh, uh, training in this. <laughs> I didn't just, just make it that. up. <laughs> I didn't just make it up. <laughs> I should have said that ahead of time. As a disclaimer, so, do just, not do that. Ju just use the distraction technique and was able to calm the patient down by just following my hand. And within three to five minutes, the patient calmed down. The MD walked away. The nurses walked away. Everyone sort of walked away. The staff said that I put everybody in a trance because I was really calm. <laughs> I was nice and calm. But it goes to show how the biology of the patient was being affected by the psychology of the patient. Got the patient back into the room, was able to care, care give for the patient, and then, get the, and then the, the, the therapist for the day came in. But this is so closely connected. If we separate this, although at times I'd like to separate my head and put it away for a while, it doesn't separate. So you have to take care of both. And what we're finding in our practice is the majority of the problems that are occurring are occurring because of up here. What and, that and, mind yeah, is thinking. You can add to that story that once he calmed the patient down, he put it in the room of the therapist, and one of the family members walked in, and the person had another seizure. So what does that tell you? Yes. Something yeah, we need to so. investigate there, yes. because most of these are trauma-related. So immediately, as a therapist who's been working with these patients, Joe knew what to do and know that, you know, where he need to go to find, to help that patient figure out um, how to overcome that trauma that they were experiencing. Yes. And um, <coughs> Joe does really interesting therapy in the sense, strategic therapy, he tells a person to have the seizure not at 12, but try to have it at, no uh, at, at, at 10. You know, and then... And it works. And it works, yeah. It, it works. really, it, it, the, it just works. It's really interesting to see the way the mind controls the body. It's so interesting to see, and I'm, I feel privileged to be able to practice, to have a practice like that. It's very, very interesting. So, okay, so now we know those two are very connected. The, the next two pictures are about the individual health behaviors. Now, we cannot talk enough about individual health behaviors that we need to work on because we have learned and i have mona here in the room with us a living example of someone who's been struggling with diabetes for many many years and she always tells a story so mona i don't think you mind that i can just say that all right she's always our champion um she had to learn that in order to manage diabetes, she needs to make lifestyle changes. And lifestyle changes has to do with eating right, exercising, figuring out how to manage stress. And she tried for years, for years to get me off those chips that I like to eat. Remember that, Mona? 
keep telling me, you need to look into that, you can't do that. Until I figured out that, yeah, I seriously can't do that because I have a genetic predisposition to get Alzheimer's disease. And when I learned that, I was so scared, I immediately got off the chips. <laughs> and I started eating healthy and I started exercising. And my life has changed because of it. It's just so good to experience that you can take control. You don't have your genetics to be in control of you. You can take charge. And that is what we have been doing with that. And we want to teach people about that. Okay. Then also we have the access piece. We already talked about how difficult it was to get access, even though we are both university professors with PhD degrees, we had trouble accessing the right people to give us the care, the care we needed. Think about the people who do not have that, or the insurance, what happens to them? We need to figure that out. We also need to figure out the environment, make sure the environment is safe. That's the environmental determinants of health. And then lastly, the social determinants of health. We need to make sure that people have the resources they need, the education they need to manage their diseases. They have to have the money to manage their diseases. Uh, they need to have health insurance, they need to have caregiver support. All of those things, we are lucky. Me and my husband are the luckiest people ever. We can keep our jobs. We can keep our insurance. That's amazing. We can go in, into in-network doctors that cost us almost nothing to get the most amazing care. Next people, we just read a story about the person who lost the job because she was taking care of her son who has leukemia, and now she doesn't have insurance anymore to cover the care of her child. How do you handle that? That is terrible, and we need to figure out a way to look at people holistically and put these resources in place so that they don't have to struggle like that. So let us tell you a little bit about what we're doing at Flourish Care. So Flourish Care is a wraparound program. When a patient comes into the, into the Optimal Aging Clinic, we, it's called the Republic Bank Optimal Aging Clinic, when a patient comes in, they're met by a Flourish Care specialist who's a trained master's level student that's trained in medical social work, medical care. They have a lot of MA training, really a full broadband training. They meet the patient. The patient then connects with them. We do a full health risk assessment on every patient that comes in. We also have 40 students doing their practicums with us. So a student it works with the Flourish Care Specialist. So the student's getting educated in doing this. Students are out in the lobby with the patients. They then come back to the clinic. They meet the MA who does the vitals, the doctor, the Flourish Care Specialist stays on this process, stays with the patient. So the patient has one person that they know is going to be consistent in their health care, sees the doctor, finishes with the doctor. The Flourish Care Specialist knows to ask, what are you eating? What is the patient eating if the doctor doesn't have the time? Because you know that there's those blocks of time that have to be spent, uh, the limited blocks of time spent with the patient. Then the patient goes out, next appointment is made. They have the option, we're in the process now over the next six months, we're building out a 24 to 28 uh, person cooking kitchen, a training kitchen, to actually teach people how to cook. And medical students, that was And one medical of the students, things. absolutely. And we're, we're also infusing physical therapy on our lower level, we're going to have exercise equipment. We have an elder law clinic, yoga and meditation, all of our mental health. We have telehealth. Massage so therapy. Massage therapy, acupuncture. acupuncture. All in one space. We're able to telehealth in our cardiologists and our specialists rather than coming in. So we're trying to really change the way and innovate the way healthcare is offered. And that's what this whole system is about. And really, the big innovation is that there's no one person as the lead on the team. The team is the leader. So it takes a lot of the pressure away from the MD who has to squeeze a lot of information into a short period of time, because now a lot of the information we need, we, we get it in the beginning. It goes into the system so they know, and then that patient is really protected in this, in this holistic way. Right, and as you can see there, there's a lot of people around that table, and that's the goal. If we, we see ourselves as a living lab, so 
it's not always possible to have paid providers that are of all those professions. But then we use interns and residents, and we have Sullivan's Pharmacy School rotates through us. The School of Nursing have students rotating through us. We have we are very closely connected with the Area Agency on Aging to deal with all of the social connections we need to make and the social support that, that is needed. Um, we really try to create an awareness that all of these things are needed to support a patient and then provide it right in our space or remotely, as, as Joe said before. And then we're also doing Project Echoes. I don't know if you're familiar That's with Project... Nice. Project Echo. Project Echo is a worldwide mentoring system for medical problems. It started in remote areas of Africa, and we have pr three Project Echoes going now. We're probably going to have four of them where people are out in the community and they're able to zoom in with our team right there at the table to actually look at their health care to see what's the best plan for a person. So to that point, just to give you an example, so my husband goes for his first round of chemo, no one talks to him about pain management, no one helps him understand constipation, and suddenly he is on the floor for two days. I can't get him off the floor because he's in so much pain and he's so constipated. I call the office, the office says, give him Tylenol. Okay, I tried Tylenol, it's not working. Then they tell me, give him Senna S. I do all of that. I've already been doing that. Nothing is working. And then one of my colleagues said, why don't you present his case at Project Echo? And we present his case at Project Echo. I give the diagnosis. I give the type of chemo he gets. And around the table sits all these specialists in palliative care, in cancer care, in nursing care, in social support. And my goodness, what a powerful experience that was. I could have sat in my house doing that, and I would have get all the advice I needed to make this round of chemo the best ever. Because those people sat, they evaluated the situation, and they gave us such good guidance. It empowered us. And the next day, we saw the oncologist, and we said, this is what they recommended. Oops, I should have told you. That is what we heard. Oops, I should have told you I'm sorry. And yes, that's, that's okay, but now we're empowered and we know what to do, and that's because of this kind of structure that we, I can be at my house doing something like that and get the education I need to take care of my husband. So what's good for us is that we have the School of Medicine behind us, so we really have support to do this. That's really one of the benefits that we have. We have a university that's supporting us to do this. And you skipped the one slide. Okay, I'll So this is what our, no? Oops. This is what our, our Traeger Institute looks like right now. So you can see it's an open concept. We have a lot of plants, a lot of, one patient came in and she said, I feel like I went to a lounge today which is a great, it was like the greatest compliment she could have given. So it's really open, we're trying to keep it open and change the way, we have free parking in the back. Please come and visit us, come over and see what we're doing. It's just at 204 East Market Street and we're always there. We all now realize now that we're running a clinic, we have to get to work at seven o'clock versus we were getting there at 8, 8.30. But uh, it's changed, so someone's always there and it's an exciting place. And it's not done yet. We still have a lot of work to do here, but it's the beginning of our journey. So, Joe asked me to come up with what would I think is something that I believe that this place that we just discussed and this kind of innovation that we're talking about can do for me and my husband. And really, what I believe we can do, if he was our patient, and he wasn't, he was someone else's patient, but if he was our patient, we would have immediately gave him a flourish care specialist to manage all of these appointments, get him to the doctors he needed to, and I believe that that would have helped us to make the diagnosis much earlier and at the less aggressive stage. Also, I would have been able, because we're working on that specific application, is to feed all of his electronic health records into one system that is easy for him to see and read. Currently, when I go to the doctor, the stack is this high because I have to take everything with him because I don't know what they have and what they don't have. So that needs to go away, and we are working on a solution as we speak. Then. I also believe that we would have given him much better counseling on the symptoms he can expect and the type of chemo he's going to get. I would have given him 
great ideas about how to manage nausea um, as part of, you know, while he's in treatment. I would have talked to him about yoga. I would have talked to him about acupuncture. I would have talked to him about CBD oil. All of those things we uncovered on our journey because the only advice we got was Tylenol and Senna S. Didn't work. So all of these things, with the, with the understanding that I've got an army around me that will help me understand what these are, I would have done. Also, I would have done this comprehensive assessment we talked about and used the strengths that he has in his environment, like a very strong church community who supports him all the way, who's actually every day bringing food to the hospital for him. And then I would use that to help him deal with his depression and anxiety related to the disease. And he's, he can't be with people for, next, for the next six months. We only decided to go to church on a Sunday. That's it. That's the only thing we do. Rest of the time, that's his only interaction with people. But that's okay because we have this strong community. But we, 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 we had to figure this out. We really had to figure this out. And then I would have had, there would be someone daily checking up on us calling us with Zoom technology to hear how we're doing. And we'll be the flourish case specialist. What do you need? What can I do for you? Do you need an acupuncturist? Can I send it to your home? What can I help you? Do you want to do yoga? Do you know how to do yoga? Well, can I send you this video? Or maybe you can zoom into the class that we're teaching at the institute. Those are the things that we are going to do and make happen. We are going to have a lot of support for me. I'm the caregiver. I need support. And I'm going to make sure I get it. And we're going to use people like my husband as a living lab to investigate what works, what doesn't work, what payment models work to make sure that we can have this wraparound service surrounding a person with an illness. So we only have about, you can stay on this, you oh. can stay on that slide. So we, we only have, we, we have no more time. We're out of time. So, uh, and we want to leave time for questions. Yes. But before, before we do that, just let me end with, we all want you to flourish and want you to experience, so we're going to do a little, little uh, exercise. We want you to is experience what it feels like to flourish. You willing to just do a two-second experiment? The experiment is I want you to turn to the person next to you and tell them how awesome they are. That's what it feels like to flourish. It didn't take very much, did it? No, it really doesn't take very much. That's that feeling that we want all our patients to have and really everybody that interacts with us to have. And Dr. Fall, you're awesome. And you're okay, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Ben? I have two questions. Yes. Yes. Yes, so question number one, they came from our existing ULP panel and our existing panel that we have at the Institute. Plus marketing. Plus we did some marketing. Yes, just, yes, 588-4340. That's the phone number, yes, 588-4340, press number one. No, she's just dialed. So we are a ULP clinic, and that was like wonderful working with ULP. That was so helpful to us to actually starting a clinic. We didn't realize how difficult, it, Anna and I didn't realize how difficult it was. Dean Cancel told us, but we didn't listen. We, <laughs> we didn't, didn't listen. No, we didn't realize how difficult it was, because what we're doing is we're trying to, pro we're, we're, we are providing bundled care in a fee-for-service model. Because no one understands that if we could provide bundle care, that's what we're trying to do, and be paid by in a bundle payment, it would be much better for the patients and also the healthcare system. Because we could, re we could reverse diabetes if we teach people to eat a predominantly plant-based diet, exercise. There's ways to do it. These are all of our dreams over the next year that we're going to be rolling out. So you had another question that was, the, the one was the patient, and then there was one, oh yes, the cost benefit and the... Um, right, yeah. 
good. Okay, great, good. <laughs> All right, we'll see. We'll Where's the opening? In. We will get her um, in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Right. Yes. So I, I want to say this to you. So we have studied this whole model for at least five years now with federal funds we received and federal support and federal training. So now we, we, we did it for five years using students. And now we take this model and we put it in a clinic. And we scaled it. So that in itself is, is a big step forward from just you know, having students out there. We still use the students a lot because we do believe that part of the scaling it is also understanding that you know you have to experiment with ideas and with thoughts and with training and things like that and treat and, and help train the next workforce. Um, but we're working with a consultant who sits with us weekly and he look at okay did you bill right you know and 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 how can you reduce cost here how can you increase your profit margin here there's never going to be a profit in a primary care place like this never but we do believe we can make it work if we do it right. So we're taking it one step at a time. We actually meet twice a day to talk about what's working and what's not working. And it's, so I think we need to check back at next year's Converge Louisville and I can give you a year analysis. Um, but that is a very valid question. Yeah, we actually hired five of our students. Students that we trained, while they were students going through school, we hired them, they're our flourish care specialists. So they know the system. And that's our goal, really, is to train this workforce that's able to do something different. Graduated students, yes, graduated students, correct. Any other questions? Well, thank you all for your time and attention, oh. appreciate it. There was one more question oh, there. Oh, one more question? Okay, okay. okay. All, right. All, right. all right, thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Anna and Joe.